So uh, we have the mind not delighting in the my mind will not delight. My mind will rise above the whole world. Yeah. So this is the uh, again. Now you can see here the idea of this five sense world is what is mostly meant by this. Uh, and now we can see why these contemplations that we had before are so useful. Yeah. Those contemplations that we had before, especially the one about the uh, borrowed goods, it is a kind of anicca sanya, it is a kind of impermanence. Yeah, you understand that that world is very impermanent, very unreliable, and from that perception, the mind that arises above the world. Yeah, this is what this sutta is about. Using the idea, perception of impermanence, uh, to give rise to these kind of positive consequences, the mind in samadhi, the mind that goes beyond these things. So that's kind of what is happening here. Yeah. Okay. My mind will incline to extinguishment. Yeah, yeah the mind will incline to nibbana. So if you want to be extinguished, that is good. If you don't want to be extinguished, this is a problem there. This is, well, this is a benefit, right? So it's good that uh, the mind inclines to extinguishment. Uh, when you see the impermanence, uh, then you are no longer interested in the things of the world. Uh, you become, you give up some of your desires towards these things. Uh, uh, you are uh, inclined towards the ending of these defilements. The ending of defilements is what extinguishment means first and foremost. Uh, it means extinguishment of dukkha also. Uh, this is what nibbana is. The first aspect of Nibbana means becoming an Arahant, becoming an awakened one. Uh, so incline towards the ending of things, uh, towards the extinguishment of things, because you start to understand Dukkha, and so you want to give all of these things up. You understand the problems of the defilements of the mind, uh, because it is defilements of the mind, uh, they, um, uh, they uh, un, you know, why would you desire things that are impermanent? Uh, you don't want that anymore, so you want to give up those uh, Defilement, and those defilements are the opposite of extinguishment. Uh, so incline towards Nibbana. So if Nibbana is nice, that's good. Uh, so you can take it that Nibbana is nice. Nibbana paramang sukhang. Nibbana is the highest happiness according to this beautiful verse in the Dhammapada, which I would really recommend you to have a look at. Uh, it's a beautiful collection of verses, uh, many nice and inspiring little things uh, like Nibbana paramang sukhang. Okay. My fetters will be given up. So, uh, is that good or bad? It's good. Yeah. You know what the meaning of fetter is? It's kind of an old-fashioned word. Many people don't know what the meaning of fetter is. So, if you imagine in the old days when you get go to prison, you have like a steel link around your foot. Yeah, and you have a chain. Yeah, and then you're kind of fastened to the wall or fastened to a ball or something like that. That's a fetter. You're a fetter. Yeah. It's like a tie, it's like a bond, you're bonded, yeah? And so the idea here is that we are affected to sangsaric existence. We are affected to the round of birth and death, yeah? We are tied to this, yeah? And of course, being tied to something means you are not free. This is the opposite of freedom. You are tied, what are you tied to? Actually, you are tied to suffering. Yeah, you're fettered to suffering, bound to suffering. Yeah, that is really what it comes down to. Huh? That's kind of scary. And not only are we bound to suffering, we rejoice in the fact uh, that we are bound to suffering. Uh, yay! Everything is so wonderful and beautiful. Uh, yeah, you are rejoicing in the fact that you're bound to suffering. Uh, that's really what this comes, what this really is about. Uh, and so once you understand what is going on here, and you understand that you want to step out of the jail, uh, out of bondage, uh, then these factors are giving up by contemplating impermanence, uh, because nothing is worth holding on to. Sabbe dhamma nalang abhinivesaya. Yeah, nothing is worth holding on to. This is one of those famous sayings of the Buddha that you find inscribed around the world on stupas, uh, on uh, uh, funer funeral plaques. Yeah, this is kind of a very standard thing. Sabbe dhamma nalang abhinivesaya. Nothing is worth holding on to. Huh? Yeah? Kind of a famous, very famous saying of the Buddha. If someone asks you, tell me what Dhamma is in short, you say, Sabbe Dhamma Nalang Abhinavesaya. And they say, Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, factors are given up because of that. Uh. 
And then you have, uh, I will achieve the ultimate goal of the ascetic life. Uh, um, uh, Parama Samanyang, I think the Pali is, I will achieve the highest uh, um, asceticism, or the highest kind of monasticism yeah, that is available. That's really what it kind of means here. Yeah. So you come to the very end of the ascetic and spiritual path as a consequence. So, sounds good, doesn't it? Then? <laughs> good enough? Huh? Yeah? <laughs> So this is this little sutta, the six benefits. Seeing the six benefits is quite enough to establish the perception of impermanence in all phenomena without exception. So are you convinced? Maybe? <laughs> so these things are, many of these things are kind of, uh, they are profound, yeah? And it's not as if your mind necessarily leaps towards these things straight away. Yeah. So you have to contemplate them. You have to understand what they mean. Yeah. And uh, I have never really looked at this sutta before. I just found it fairly recently. I haven't, you know, I haven't really contemplated every single sutta because there are so many. Uh, so sometimes I like kind of teaching a retreat, coming out with some new suttas, uh, because it also broadens my own kind of uh, feeling for the Dhamma. So I hadn't really looked at this sutta until just now, until I started talking to you right here. Yeah. But, uh, you know, the themes and the ideas are similar to what you see everywhere. So these things have to be contemplated, yeah? And as you contemplate them, they start to kind of make sense, and something comes out of it. So, now I'm going to go on to another sutta, which is all about impermanence. Are you ready for more impermanence? Yes. Yeah? <laughs> Good. <laughs> Let's carry on with impermanence. Yeah. You're very brave, so we'll see what happens. So, um, this sutta is called, it's from the Sangyutta Nikaya 22. This is the Kanda Sangyutta. Uh, and this is sutta number 102. It's called the Anicca Sanya Sutta, the sutta on the perception of impermanence. Uh, yeah, so this is specifically about the topic that we're talking about now, perceptions, uh, and this particular perception that we're focusing on, impermanence. Uh, so let's see what the Buddha has to say about this. Uh, at Savati. So this is happening in the ancient capital of the Korsalan kingdom, where King Pasenadi was the king. And this is where we will be going when I go to India in, uh, uh, in December. Yeah, so for those of you who are coming to me to India, if you haven't signed up yet, now is the chance. You get to see Savati. Yeah? You get to see where this sutta happens. So if this sutta inspires you, and then you want to go to Savati as a consequence, uh, Sign up there. <laughs> <laughs> Mendicants, when the perception of impermanence, the anicca, is developed and cultivated, it eliminates all desire for sensual pleasures. Yeah, this is a karma. Yeah, the karma desire, all desires for karma. This does not mean sensual pleasures in a very narrow sense. It means sensual pleasures in the broadest sense possible. So it eliminates all desire for the five sense world. That is really what it means. And this is one of the reasons I don't like this translation as sensual pleasures, because it seems way too narrow. It actually is desire for the entire five sense world that you eliminate based on this. And now you have some idea of what that means, right? We have just been talking about the simile of the borrowed goods. Yeah, that is kind of a very strong way of thinking about the impermanence of those things. Uh, we talked about the simile of the dream, which is not so much about impermanence, but how it is really unreliable and uncertain. It is not what you think it is. Uh, and uh, you can take this much further, further than that. Uh, you can think about just your ordinary experiences in your own life. Yeah, how everything around you, everything in the world, from the largest scales of the universe as a whole. What is the universe as a whole like? Well, it kind of expands, yeah? And according to Buddhism, then it contracts again. It's the kind of big bang and the big crunch. Yeah, and uh, interestingly, if you look at the modern cosmology, there are more and more cosmologists who seem to be in favor of the big crunch idea. So I say, I'm gonna make this, uh, uh, make this prediction to you. 
And eventually, when cosmology kind of really figures out what is going on, uh, if they ever do, they're going to come, end up with a big bang and a big crunch model. Huh? Why? Because the Buddha said so. <laughs> this is what I always come back to, because the Buddha said it, yeah? So the thing is that uh, the Buddha, as a teacher, because he is such a special person, if the Buddha really said these things, and it seems that he did, uh, then I take that incredibly seriously. Yeah? And I think that if modern cosmology doesn't know what is going on, well then I say, okay, that is where they're going to end up, because this is how the Buddha said things. So we start at the very vast scales, yeah? The whole universe is kind of impermanent and unreliable. It comes back into the big crunch, and if the universe comes into a big crunch, then we are just tiny little pawns in that universe. So if the universe goes, we are also going to go, right? We don't have much chance. The only way to get out of that is to be reborn into this very high realm, so you kind of escape. Then you can watch the universe crunching, ding. And then the universe expands again, ding, yeah? And then you can get reborn as a human being, yeah? And then you can come back to the BGF. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of how it works. <laughs> so at the very large scales, you have this impermanence, yeah? Then you have the impermanence of the Earth itself. We know the Earth is going to burn up. This is another thing that you very strangely you find in the suttas uh, that the suns are going to expand, they become hotter and hotter until the earth burns up. Actually also in the suttas, I don't know how they knew these things, but it's actually how the Buddha knew this, but it's right there. So this again is impermanence on a very large scale. Then it is the impermanence I was talking about before, the impermanence in our society right now. Yeah, the impermanence of the world at large, the impermanence of anything that can happen around us. Then the impermanence in the more immediate world, yeah, the impermanence of your of the BGF, of your job, of the Malaysian economy, the Malaysian government, right? Of of uh, all of these kind of things. And then it's the impermanence kind of within your family, the people who are closest to you. Yeah, your own belongings, your own little world, your own body, your own life life and death, all of these kind of things. All of that is part of the world of the five senses. You can see how all-encompassing it is. It basically includes everything you know. And if there's anything in that world that you hold on to, including Buddhism, including ideas, ideas that belong in that world, anything that you hold on to in that world, that is where you have a desire in the world of the five senses. And the perception of impermanence actually overcomes that. It eliminates all that desire. There's a very kind of broad scale contemplation yeah, about the unreliability of a whole gamut of the five senses. Almost everything we know is in that world of the five senses. There's almost nothing apart from that. The only tiny things that are apart from that is when you do something kind, and you feel a bit of uplift, a bit of gladness, a bit of joy, because you're living well, you're doing something nice. That is the beginning of spiritual happiness. And that is what goes eventually beyond the world of the five senses. But otherwise, almost everything we know belongs to that world. There's a very broad kind of perception, yeah? And as you develop that properly, that is where samadhi becomes possible. So the next stage is samadhi. That is what we can expect next in the Sutta. So is it going to come up next? What do you think? Yeah. I'm, I have to admit, I'm cheating. I, have, I know what's coming up next. So I, I <laughs> but well, my point is just that there is a logic to the sequence in the Sutta. Yeah? Once you eliminate the world, once you have gone beyond that, uh, the next stage is... Uh, what, what? No, okay, sorry. <laughs> the next one is you eliminate desire for rebirth in the realm of luminous form. Luminous form here is Rupa Loka. Yeah, this is uh, the equivalent of the four jhanas. Uh, this is called the Rupa, Rupa Vachara, the realm of the uh, of, of form. And uh, so, you, first of all, you eliminate the five senses, uh, then you eliminate the desire for rebirth in this realm, yeah? Because you understand that even the jhanas, even the deep meditations, uh, and this is where it gets very profound, uh, you understand that these two are impermanent. These two are not a real reality. And this is where Buddhism is very interesting, because this is where Buddhism distinguishes itself from almost all other religious systems in humanity has ever had. Almost all 
religions in humanity. We start with Hinduism. Hinduism has the idea of Brahman. Brahman is kind of the consciousness behind the world. If you look up into the starry sky at night, the consciousness behind that, yeah, that is Brahman. The stars in the sky are just a manifestation of that consciousness as it manifests in the night. Yeah, this is kind of the Hindu idea of the world. If you look at Christianity or Islam, all the religions that are uh, uh, you know, centered around the idea of a creator God, yeah? Ultimately, it is about unity with that creator God that people are looking for, yeah? Especially maybe in Christianity, but also in the mystical traditions of Islam, the Sufis, these kind of things. Uh, yeah, so this is kind of what the whole world, in many ways, with the exception of Buddhism, what they see as one of the highest things that you can do, unify with this universal consciousness. Call it God, call it whatever you like, it doesn't matter. And then the Buddha comes along and says, actually, that too is not good enough. And the reason why it isn't good enough, because when you look at what actually is happening, you can never show that this God, this reality actually exists. All you can ever show is that you go into a state of samadhi and then you emerge from it. In other words, what you are seeing is always impermanent. You enter samadhi, you come out. If you based on that impermanent uh, experience of samadhi, if based on that you say that there is an eternal God, you are going beyond the evidence. You are adding permanence to what actually is impermanent. You're seeing an impermanent experience, and based on that impermanent experience, you are deducing that there must be an eternal reality beyond it. So the idea here is that the idea of these ideas, like a Hindu idea of an eternal consciousness, is a human-created idea. It's a thought. It's a supposition about the world. It's not actually an experience. And so, looking at the impermanence of these things, understanding that even this is created by the human mind, yeah, through practice, through spiritual practice, then you give up that desire for rebirth in that realm too, because you understand its limitations. It comes and it goes. And maybe you go there for an eon, and maybe it's really good fun, but at the end of it, it is no fun. If you had the highest fun for an eon, and now you're going to die and you get reborn who knows where, you can imagine how scary that is, yeah? And this is kind of the problem with these kind of things. Uh, they have an end. Say again? An adventure in Dukkha. <laughs> and then the last one, you also give up the idea of rebirth in a future life of any kind, because you understand that rebirth is always uncertain, always unreliable. Sometimes you go up, sometimes you go down, sometimes you go across, and uh, basically it is too unreliable and too uncertain. Uh, everything always changing, uh, and so you give up the whole idea of being reborn altogether. And that is where you're starting to get very close to enlightenment itself, yeah? When you give up all kinds of rebirth. Uh, so, um, I think that is a good place to stop, because the last part is, uh, uh, goes a little bit further. We need to spend a little bit of time on the last part. Uh, so let's stop there. Let's have a tea break or a coffee break, uh, according to your designs. And, and we'll, uh, see, you, see, you, see you back again at 5, 4.30. Uh, uh,